Welcome to the 2004 Grand American Rolex Sports Car Series Year in Racing. Hello everyone, I'm Lee Diffie and what a year it was for the Daytona prototypes. In just two short years we've seen an idea blossom into one of the most competitive driving series here in America. A year ago, six prototypes lined up to race the Rolex 24 at Daytona. This past February, a field of 17 prototypes began the season. A remarkable increase in participation from engine manufacturers, chassis constructors, sponsors and high-profile drivers all pointed to a spectacular racing season. We begin our highlights in Daytona where the sports car season begins at the Rolex 24. The race is in its closing laps with Tony Stewart leading but severely hampered by mechanical problems. Here's how the thrilling race unfolded. You're looking live at pit lane at Daytona International Speedway and just when it appeared that the 40-second running of the Rolex 24 at Daytona could not get any more dramatic, it has as the skies have opened once again over the speedway. Andy Pilgrim, who briefly passed the crippled car of Tony Stewart to get back on the lead lap, then ducked into the pits for treaded wet weather tires. Stewart remains on the track with a broken right rear suspension. He doesn't need new tires because he's only got two wheels on the ground at any one time. The most dramatic drive I think I have ever seen in 25 years of covering motorsports. Stewart, the 2002 NASCAR champion, is trying to hold off this man, a former Rolex winner, Andy Pilgrim. You're looking now at the wounded car of Tony Stewart for Howard Boss Motorsports, a Chevrolet-powered Crawford. This is the debut drive for this car and its sister car, the 04 and the third Crawford, the 09 Spirit of Daytona. Two of the three are still running. Sadly, the Jimmy Johnson Bush Lightsinger Elliott Forbes Robinson car is out. And there they are, both Crawfords on Ooh. track together. And look at Tony Stewart, just weaving side to side and conditions. Oh, there he's gone. Oh, no. oh he's lost the left no. rear. Left rear is completely broken, David, like you thought it might. That will end that. And there is Jim Bell, Boy, poised to take this Rolex 24 with 17 and a half minutes remaining. And look at the despair on Tony Stewart's face. And for all four drivers in this car, it will mark their first overall victory at the Rolex 24. And Forrest Barber is bringing it home. Into the bus stop for the final time, the spirit of Daytona Crawford tucked in behind. And that team, congratulations to them. They have soldiered on. They didn't stop. They didn't give up. They wanted to finish this race, and that's exactly what they will do. As Forrest Barber enters NASCAR 3 for the final time, Jim Bell and Terry Borchella, Forrest Barber, what a combination they were last year to win the Rolex Series. They go one better now. They finished last year on a high. They begin 04 with an enormous high. There he is, the car. The checkered flag is in sight, and the Texan will lead his team. Bell Motorsports wins the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Terry Borchella, Forrest Barber, Christian Filippoli, and Andy Pilgrim. Success overall, and so too for Johnny Molan. He finally gets that big career victory, taking out the GT class. Just a few seconds in front of the 74 car, and the GT cars come second and third overall. Forrest Barber absolutely ecstatic and no doubt incredibly relieved that it's all over. And you can expect Tony Stewart to return to the Rolex 24. After the car broke, Stewart said the team would be back next year, and they're determined to win the race. For the 54 team, a wonderful story of perseverance, and that's what it takes to win any endurance race. Unfortunately, that race win would be the season highlight for the Kodak Easy Share Bell Motorsports team. Up next, the season heats up in Homestead. Welcome back. One of the big announcements prior to the 2004 season was the addition of two cars from Chip Ganassi Racing. Scott Pruitt was to team up with Max Pappas, while Jimmy Morales and Luis Diaz would pilot the second entry. And it didn't take long for the Ganassi drivers to make their presence known. Pruitt won his second consecutive pole at Homestead, and the team appeared poised to win their first race of the season. But in the closing laps, the racing got a bit rough, and we saw Andy Wallace taking full advantage of the situation. Now we're getting the wide car out. We're counting That's down the happen. second flag. Magnuson almost contact. Oh, big there contact. There we go. Through to do it. We go side by side. These guys are driving each other off the road. Pappas oh, and Magnuson, they bash. They continue to bash. 
boy, oh boy, we saw the 27 in this last year with David Donahue, but it was Tays at the wheel. Now Magnuson and Pappas are giving it to each other. Now you got to watch knocking the balance stems off because they're going to both have flat tires here. And they're top speed hit. That's oh! stupid. <laughs> That's just a little bit too much. I, I wouldn't think they need a reprimand. To this go is going to win. There's a wreck. And it has. Both of boy, them. Boy, oh boy. And our man Wallace goes to the lead. That's like what they deserve. The... Both of them deserve to be right where they are. That was wild stuff on the track. They need a reprimand there. I'm just telling you, that, that's just a little too much. That's that... dangerous at 180 miles an hour being playing that game. That is wild racing. And you were riding with Max Pappas when they hit at well over 150 miles an hour. Now Pappas' door is open. We knew there was going to be contact. We knew there was going to be contact in this one, but nothing like that. And the smartest guy is going to win this race. Wallace will get the victory that he didn't get at the Rolex 24 if he can just hang in there. He has inherited the lead by these two guys' aggressiveness. Well, a little is one thing and a lot's another, and uh, they paid the ultimate price for it. Neither of these guys will win today. Plus, they get to go back to their team owners and explain why did you tear my car up like that? <laughs> boy, oh boy, knowing Chip Ganassi, he is not oh, going to no. be impressed. I wouldn't want to go back and see the boss. Let's have a look at some replays, a succession of replays. This was serious stuff. Yeah, that, that is a big monster hit, and it's at the fastest place of the whole racetrack. There, there's your payback. Take that. Now we're both going off. Neither of us going to win. Let's give it to Andy. Wow. Lucky that wasn't a much bigger wreck. Look at this. Here's the big hit. Here's the big hit. We were oh, right there. You were riding with Max Pappas when we had the onboard shot. And I'm not sure that Magnuson could pull that no. car up. Neither of these guys can even start to say this was an accident. Listen Let's go onboard again. You heard that savage replay. Now let's hear from the boss. Chip, I know you've run cars in just about every class, and we've seen this kind of stuff in cup racing, but you never expect to see it in sports car racing. Any idea what's going on out there? You know, Max comes on the radio. He says, hey, this guy's destroying our car. What is, what's he doing? What's he doing? I don't know who's driving a 27 car, but the guy thinks it's a weapon, not a car. And on the final lap, we shouldn't forget that Kelly Collins is really closing the gap rapidly on Andy Wallace. It's down to two and a half seconds there. First to second, the pressure is still on for Andy, but he's almost home. And Milka Duno hanging on because she almost is there to the checkered flag with her teammate Andy Wallace for victory in the Grand Prix of Miami. Well, there he is. Not much of a gap right now. I don't know if Andy's just playing it coy. Knowing him, he is. He's been a teammate of mine. He's very smart. Coming round for the final two turns. NASCAR three, NASCAR four. He was denied by 17 minutes in Daytona. He won't be denied today. Andy Wallace and Milka Duno win the Grand Prix of Miami. And a payback there for Max Crawford and the entire Howard Boss Motorsports team. Well done to Milka Duno. Well done, Andy Wallace. Terrific drive. The other two guys took themselves out in spectacular fashion. And Andy was there to pick up the pieces. But here's first and second in the GT class. Tom Milner will be very pleased with his boys. They've driven a sensible race and they'll come across the line with a formation finish. And once again, vindication for a terrible Daytona. This team just had a horrible time there. All three classes rectifying or making them Men's of, of what happened at Daytona. Fantastic race here today. After the disappointment of the 24 hour, you got some payback here tonight. It just goes to show, you know, motor racing, you never know who's going to win, do you? I thought at the Daytona we had it in the bag, but you never should think things like that. This was fantastic. Very happy for Mika because she's not experienced with this kind of car. She did a great job. The whole team did such a great job. You know, when we stopped every time, clockwork. The radio work was fantastic. I thought we struggled a bit uh, midweek with the balance of the car, but it just came good on race day. I love this place. <laughs> that win by Wallace sent him atop the point standings with a four-way tie for second place. The Ganassi drivers had yet to break into the top five, but the season was young. Pappas and Magnussen were fined for their driving antics at Homestead, but the race certainly defined the 2004 season. The championship would be hard fought, the pushing and shoving had just started, and the title would go down to the final race of the season.
The Homestead race was still making headlines when the Rolex series arrived in Phoenix six weeks later. The desert track was much tighter and contact between these evenly matched cars was almost a certainty. For the 01 car of Scott Pruitt and Max Pappas, the big question was not if they would win, but where and when. The team won their third pole in three races and were once again considered the favourites. But another high-profile team of Wayne Taylor and Max Angelelli stole the show and won their first race of the year. We may have had the same car on pole in all three races this year, but we will have three different race winners. It was Barber, Borchella, Andy Pilgrim and Christian Fittipaldi winning the Rolex 24. It was Andy Wallace and Mil Caduno at Homestead. Now our third different winner in as many races. It's Wayne Taylor, Max Angelelli win in Phoenix. Sensational stuff for the SunTrust team. Taylor can't believe it. And they celebrate and rightly so. Tremendous effort from those boys. Meanwhile, in the SGS class, Dave Murray taking the fight to Randy Popes, and I think they've run out of time. That's Randy up ahead. Murray really forcing the issue. So close, just not enough time. But a good game plan, a really good game face this time. This Asco Porsche, really good job. And Randy Pope celebrates with the hand out the window. In GT land, it was Boris Said and Bill Orbelin. They got their uh, second consecutive class victory ahead of Kyle Petty and Gunnar Jeanette. Here's our GT class winning car. And, and they the were the only car by class that had a pretty easy goal, but everybody else has had to fight tooth and nail. Boris and Bill, dominant once again, 21, tough machine. Max Angelali, what a drive you put together there, qualifying speed for over an hour there. Thank you very much, I really enjoyed This car is just ro ro is running by herself, I mean, it's really, really is. That was good, a little bit hot, but fine, I enjoy, really enjoy. All of a sudden, Angelelli and Taylor were just three points behind Court Wagner and Kelly Collins in the title chase. But cracking into the top five points were Pappas and Pruitt, who finished second in Phoenix. On to mont -Blanc, north of Montreal, for round four of the series. Guess who's on pole again? Yes, the 01 continued their qualifying dominance, and six hours later, under caution, won their first race of the season. The 10 car of Taylor and Angelelli had a disastrous outing, finishing 18th after a day-long mechanical problem that put them 14 laps behind the leaders. Pappas and Pruitt went from fourth to first in the points, while Angelelli and Taylor fell to fifth. The season was far from over, but each race was becoming crucially important. Remember the 54 car and the big win at Daytona? Well, after that victory celebration, the season went south for the Bell Motorsports team. At Homestead, cold tyres betrayed Forrest Barber on the first lap, sending them to a sixth place finish. A shove once again on the first lap at Phoenix sent them home in 13th. It couldn't get any worse going into the fourth round, could it? Wrong. The team's misfortunes began before the green flag at mont -Tremblant. The Forest Barber driving in practice, a wheel problem occurred sending the car hard into the tyre wall. Forrest was OK, but excused himself from driving duties for the rest of the weekend. Terry Borcella and Andy Pilgrim brought the car home in third, their first podium since Daytona and the last of the season. Their misfortunes would continue, as you'll see later in the show. Up next, the Grand American Rolex Sports Car Series heads to Watkins Glen. Endurance racing is a combination of patience, teamwork and a touch of luck. And at the six hours of the Glen, the 01 car once again proved itself worthy of victory, despite at one time being two laps down. And frustration for the Ganassi team, but if there is a team on this pit lane that can address it and fix it as fast as possible, it is this organisation. Look at them diving in head first to address this situation. He's headed for the paddle assembly down there and he needs to go from back to staying in the car. He'll pull his feet back as much as he can, but that's no more than an inch or so. The mechanics are going to have to get down in there and see if the uh, cable is hung up there. Or back here, where the mechanics are working at the throttle engine. It's absolutely amazing that the 0-1 car was down two laps in the first couple hours of this race. Made up all that ground and is now looking like it might win with just eight minutes left in the race. Well, when we started the show, we mentioned about the possibility of five different winners. That will not happen. And we get our first repeat winner of the season. And it's a back-to-back -back winner at that. The Comp USA Ganassi Racing with Felix Sabatis.
they will celebrate again. Montremblant, they do it here at Watkins Glen. They capture both six-hour events. The 0-1 Ganassi car, Scott Pruitt, Max Pappas, they do it and they do it perfectly. If you were to talk to me, well, actually we did talk about 10 minutes in. I was just hopeful to get back a couple laps and salvage something and to come home with a win. It's pretty awesome. It says a lot about the team. Max, why don't you come on over here? Max, you were the one who was in the car early in the race. You had that throttle problem. You went down two laps. How do you stay excited and stay focused to get the car back on the lead lap? You know, that was a very good team effort. You know, today, you know, I drove the wheel off the car in the beginning in the first uh, couple of hours. And, uh, you know, two in a row is very good. With back-to-back -back wins, Pruitt and Pappas lead the point standings. Consistency keeps Wagner and Collins close in second place. We've already documented the problems of the defending champions, the 54 Kodak Easy Share Bell Motorsports team, and at the six hours of the Glen, it didn't get any better. Turn one on the first lap was another nightmare for the team as Forrest Barber got knocked off course. Later in the day, a blown tyre sent the car into a spin as well. The team would battle all day and settle for a ninth place finish. With five races gone, it was becoming obvious that Terry Borcella's days as the Grand American Rolex champion were numbered. The Paul Revere 250 over the July 4th holiday didn't help matters at all. Borcella gets tagged by the 81 of Port Wagner and takes a tough hit into the wall, with Wagner adding one final hit in the process as they come to rest. It was easy to see the frustrations on Borcella's face as he went over to discuss the incident with Court. In just six short months, Borcella had experienced the best and the worst at Daytona. On the other face of racing luck, the SunTrust team made it look easy on their way to their second win of the season. In fact, they had already taken the chequered flag when the race for second stole the show. Our race leader, Max Angelelli, is on the way home and he is bringing it through the bus stop. He's only got to complete NASCAR three and four and it's victory here in Florida. This is the fight for third. Andy Wallace in the middle, Darren Law to the left, bus stop for the final time. Who will it be? Oh, it's going to be a good run to the finish if Andy can get out of here. Check He's it. got the run. He's got it. Checkered flag is out for Angelelli and the SunTrust team. Second victory of the year for Max Angelelli and Wayne Taylor. They do it at Daytona, but side by side, Andy Wallace comes up. Darren Law's got the inside run, and Butch Leitzinger gets in the draft of his teammate. Wallace has got it. Andy Wallace on the final lap gets there, and so too does Butch Leitzinger. A draft. Driving, and they relegate Law in the closing stages from third to fifth. And Wallace and Tony Stewart stand on the podium in Daytona. That was perfect by Butch Leitzinger. He double drafted. He got up behind his teammate and pushed him up ahead, just like in NASCAR. He got a good draft, and they just left the Porsche in its dust. And look at Max Angelelli celebrating in the cockpit. And he knew that he could take those guys at the end. GT class winning, leading, and about to be winning car. An incredible stretch for Bill Orblin, California. Five straight GT class wins. And he is well and truly on his way to being champion again. Boris said had a three point margin. Coming into this race, Bill Orblin will be on top of the points now in GT. Pappas draws alongside Angelelli and congratulates him. The two Italians, one and two. Two Riley chassis cars, but the winning car of Pontiac Power Plant over the Lexus. And Wayne Nonamaker in the 41 has done a marvelous job here in Florida tonight. And they pick up their first SGS victory. An amazing performance. We've had Doncaster racing. We've had Arsco racing and TPC racing, but never the Nonamakers. The Planet Earth Motorsports boys come across the line for their first Super Grand Sport victory. Well done to the Ohio based family. The Nonamakers celebrate in Florida. That first win of the year for the Nonamakers in the SGS class proved they were still a threat on any weekend. And they would prove that again in very short notice. GT driver Bill Orblin was clearly on his way to another championship. The Paul Revere 250 was his first race with Justin Marks, and they would remain teammates for the rest of the season. Back to the Daytona prototypes with six races still to go, and not only were Angelelli and Taylor in striking distance of Pruitt and Pappas, Andy Wallace had joined the hunt with that great finish in Daytona. It was mid-season, and the Rolex circuit was heading to mid-Ohio.
As the Rolex Sports Car Series hit the season halfway mark, a couple of things were quite clear. Bill Orblin would be very tough to beat for the GT title. The SGS was once again competitive with five different winners in six races. And if you were going to win the DP title, you'd have to beat the 0-1 of Scott Pruitt and Max Pappas. In their previous four races, they had won twice, finished second twice, and came from outside the top five in the points to lead the championship chase. To make matters more difficult, the 0-1 started on the pole for the sixth time in seven races. At the end of the day, Scott returned the car first to the chequered flag. Seven cars on the lead lap as we bring it toward the chequered flag. And Andy Wallace, Milka Duno, very valuable championship points. And that will leapfrog Andy a few positions in the championship standings, I'm sure. He's well positioned in the top five. In fact, make that he's third behind the Ganassi and SunTrust duo. So very, very valuable day here for Andy Wallace as we ride home with the 0-1 of Scott Pruitt. Two wins apiece coming into this one between the 0-1 and the 10. Now the CompUSA boys, the Ganassi team, take the higher ground in the 2004 Rolex Sports Car Championship. Pruitt won here back in 87 in Trans Am. Now he's a Rolex Sports Car winner at Mid-Ohio. Pappas and Pruitt and Ganassi, they do it. And the MQ is... And the SGS battle rages here between the Nonamaker and the TPC guys. Jean-Francois Dumoulin is in there. He is pushing as hard as he can. So too is Andy Lally. Look at this sideways stuff. Lally forces his way through in the 38. And Nonamaker, Wayne Nonamaker is under siege. He gave him a shot right there. They got a half a lap to go. And this is for the first, second, third place. That's actually the battle for the lead. Jean-Francois Dumoulin tries to come back on Lally. He can't. It's They're gonna, old mates from the Lexus days. And Wayne Nonamaker's under siege. It's going to get ugly up here. Not this one, not this left hand, but the next one. The next right hand or the carousel. It's the only place anybody can do anything. It's not easy to do there. Watch. And Wayne Nonamaker's got enough. He will get his second consecutive victory. But look at the teammates going hard at it. Dumoulin and Andy Lally fighting to the line. Well done, Wayne Nonamaker. Back-to-back oh. -back victories in the Super Grand Sport class. And a thrilling race to the line. <laughs> what a battle. With the TPC boys and Justin Marks, Bill Orblin win their second consecutive race. But for Bill Orblin, that is six victories in a row. Quite stunning. And he is well on his way to being a GT Rolex champion yet again. He did it two years ago. And Bill Orblin and young Justin Marks, another fine effort. But here is Scott Pruitt, he and Pappas. They've done it again. The Lexus-Riley combination, victorious for the third time. From mid-Ohio, the series travelled to the Glen. Everything was going fine until the rains came. All the drivers were aware of it being obviously damp out there. And then all of a sudden, I came around turn 10, the last left-hander, and it was like beetles hitting the windshield. No steering, no brakes. It was running water across the track. Oh, someone and else goes. Crash. The 33 has gone. And another one. Well. There goes the two. Steve Earl and the two of Milka Duno. I'd already popped my belt. They said, stay in the car, stay in the car. And as I looked in the mirror, I could see other cars still coming to the wall. So I held on. We had a minor impact when the 36 came in, or he got hit and got knocked in the knee. Oh, oh the Joey Hand goes as well. Oh, another one. Oh, my gosh. We're losing the, whole the field. field. After that, people, I heard people spinning. Uh, the white Corvette came in 30 seconds after the initial run. Oh, that was a big hit. Oh, my goodness. I guess uh, Levitus didn't realize that I was behind him, and he started trying to back up and pull forward to rock his way out, and he was crushing my side pod. And look how hot J.C. France is. France is not happy. Look at this. Over to one of the TPC Porsches. I wanted to get out of there, and J.C. was behind me, and he couldn't move, and I kept backing up into him. So, you know, one thing kind of led to another. J.C. France still going at Mike Levitus as Tempest are afraid. Thankfully, everyone was okay, and in the end, Kevin Doran's team would break out of a wind drought to become the fifth different Daytona prototype winner in eight races. The team, based in Ohio, one of the original manufacturers in the Daytona prototype category in the Rolex Sports Car Series, is about to get a one-two result. And Michael Shank needs to get on the phone with Oswald and say, Oswald, you're not going to catch first, you got second. Calm it down, buddy, just calm it down. You're going to be on the podium, you got a solid second. They're on their way home. Jan Magnussen and Didier Taze, a former Rolex Sports Car Series champ, 
the Belgian and the Dane in an American built car. The Lexus power plant running to the line. What a day for Kevin Doran and his boys. The first ever win in Daytona prototypes. Jan Magnussen, Didier Tays, and that man there, Kevin Doran, do it. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. A win that has been long overdue. And done so properly with the right call on those slicks. That was just made the whole difference. They hung tight. The whole entire race got down to the where the money part is paid, and they did it right. And there they are. There's Oswald on Angry. That's Michael Shank on the right. Their best ever result, and that could just save them. Well, two very happy drivers, Didier Tejan Magnuson and Didier you first. You've driven this car all year long, and to give Kevin Doran his first team win this season just has to feel wonderful for you. Well, it's not only one driver. It's a complete teamwork. You know, the team worked very well together. Kevin had the best strategy of the day, and uh, we're very pleased with the result. Well, and you handed it over to Jan Magnussen, who's getting congratulations. And Jan, probably not a worse time for you to get the car in the wet, but Kevin looked at me and he said, Jan likes the rain. He's a little crazy that way. No, um, I like the rain. I don't mind racing in the wet. Um, and when we got started, we were good straight away. I think I pushed too hard and burned some of the tire too fast, but we went on slicks at right at the right moment. And that's all she wrote. <laughs> That is all she wrote, guys. They pulled it away. Gutsy call, but it paid off. But the happiest guys out here may be with Calvin Fish. Absolutely, Brian. What a result for Mike Shank Racing. Ozzy Negri, Bert Frizzell coming in second. Ozzy, you needed this result so bad. This was possibly your last race of the season. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that, that's just, I mean, I, I, I can't think of uh, anything to say, but, uh, you know, thank you for the team and, and thanks for, the, for Granham, you know, for having a series like that if it's our last uh, last race it's a good farewell and we're gonna keep working hard to come back i have to thank my teammate for the awesome job he did on the last few laps and mike shank uh, racing for all the effort and uh, you guys i mean everybody i, I can't think of uh, you know names to thank i mean everybody thank you Although a lack of sponsorship dollars continued to hurt their efforts, Oswaldo Negri Jr. and Bert Frizzell would finish out the season running for Michael Shank Racing. When we return, an on-call visit to Homestead as the points begin to tighten up. If you were leading in any of the three classes, Daytona Prototypes, GT or SGS, you'd probably want to forget about Homestead. All three point leaders had a tough day, allowing their competitors a ray of hope. In SGS, Mark Bunting and Andy Lally could only muster an eighth place finish, the first and only time they were not on the podium the entire season. GT frontrunner Bill Orbelin came to rest with mechanical problems, only the second time he would not visit Victory Lane up to that race. And while chasing the 10, his main championship rival, Scott Pruitt went off course, sending him back to 10th place. In the end, Pruitt's title contenders battled it out for the win. Well, we know Andy Wallace is one cool customer. Whatever happens out here this afternoon, we know Angela Ali certainly gets fired up, so it may be advantage Wallace there. But one thing I love about this Crawford team is the way they go racing. They just take everything in their stride. Remember the disappointment of the 24 hours of Daytona. They still had a smile on their face. I stand by Max Crawford. He was looking at the lap times as Ali came by and cranked off what we believe is the fastest lap of the race, and he just laughed. He said, I guess those guys just changed the fuel map and found the boost button. They just take it all in this stride with a smile to see how the chips fall, boys. <laughs> Max, I've driven for several times. He's a cool cucumber, but okay. Whoa, here comes Andy. Andy with a big run to the outside, splits oh, a Porsche. That's the move of the race. Andy Wallace swoops into the lead as they split the lap traffic. Sensational stuff from Wallace. Used a lap car as a pick, went around the outside, and Angela Lee had no idea that was coming door. Did we? Fantastic move, race winning move, maybe. Wallace had the slingshot off NASCAR 4 and went right between the two lapped Porsches. Now he's got to be defensive because Angelelli's dander is up. I guarantee you it is right now. He'll be having none of it. He's going to be demonic in the break zone. That's what he's known for. That was an Angelelli style move. Brilliant from Andy Wallace in the closing minutes of the Miami 250. There's Milka Duno. Could she be a victor twice this year? Let's have a look in NASCAR 4 on review at this amazing move. Talk us through, Dawson. Truly brilliant piece of driving. Look right here, a big run coming around the outside, but there's a Porsche in the way, and that blocks Angelelli, who has to cut down around it. Andy finds a way between the other two and carries that momentum off the top. Look here, on board with the 10, he's blocked. Here comes Andy, around the top of the nine. There he is. I guarantee you, he, he didn't, didn't know that was coming at all. And now he's gapped him. 
What an amazing performance from Andy Wallace. The white flag is not too far away. I think we'll have two laps to run from here. We'll see the white next time by. Wallace did indeed win the race and made up a huge amount of points on Pruitt and Pappas. The 10 car was now within eight points. With three races left, strategy was simple. If you want to win this championship, you must win the remaining races. Put on your seatbelts, things start to get real serious when we return. Welcome back to the 2004 review of the Grand American Rolex Sports Car Series. The situation is quite clear with three races remaining. In order to have a chance against Scott Pruitt and Max Pappas, Wayne Taylor, Max Angelelli and Andy Wallace had to win at Virginia International Raceway. The race was intense right from the start. Max Pappas, Wayne Taylor side by side and look at them, they're leaning on each other right before the green. Here we go at VIR. A little intimidation factor right there as Max dumps. Here comes Oswaldo Negri in the sixth, great move. And Darren Law, Law comes back from fifth, squashes up the inside, Taylor's been pushed wide. Wow, some big movement, you're right on board with Christian Fittipaldi. But look at that, Oswaldo Negri Jr. forceful from the start and puts the shank car right into second place. And I think Wayne Taylor went into conservation mode right away. He didn't want any part of that bumping at the beginning. Wallace is there, he's right there. One has become two, two has become three, and we've got one and a quarter laps to go. And you'd have to put your money on Andy Wallace here. He's caught them at an incredibly rapid rate. Andy Wallace has the quickest car, but he's got a tough decision with all these slower cars oh, in the way. Oh, look at this. Up to Splits the them down the back straight. This is where Wallace has been strong, but he's on the outside line. Pruitt will have the preferred line going down here. No bumping now, boys. They'll send anybody spinning. There's no grip right now. Whoa. Look at the pressure. One lap to go. 3.27 miles. Who will be our winner? Will it be back-to-back -back victories for Andy Wallace if he can go from third to first? Will it be the third victory for SunTrust? Or can Scott Pruitt extend his championship lead? This is it. It looks like it may remain the same because they do not want to make any silly moves. There is too much on the line. And this is it. Three victories for the SunTrust team. The championship margin is now only five points. Max the Axe, Angelelli, Steers, he and Wayne Taylor closer to a Daytona prototype championship. SunTrust wins at VAR over Chip Ganassi Racing. And the two sit co Crawford of Andy Wallace and Milka Duno third. In SGS, Randy Pope's Mike Levitas, fourth victory of the year. Superb performance from the TPC Porsche team. They've done it again, and Mike Levitas reduces the margin to Andy Lally and Mark Bunting. And the 21 PTG BMW M3, Bill Orblin and young Justin Marks have done it again. And that will extend Bill Orblin's championship lead over Boris said. It's a BMW 1-2 in GT. Two races to go, still in the lead of the championship, so too bad for the other guys. That finish was the closest in the history of the prototypes. The SunTrust team did what they had to do. With two races left, the strategy remained the same. They needed to win. You couldn't ask for more from a racing series than what the Daytona prototypes were delivering this year. In just a matter of two seasons, it had the road racing community's attention big time. Going into Birmingham, the stakes remained high, the point situation was crucial. Pappas' quote after Virginia when he said he and Scott still had the points lead, too bad for the other guys, was certainly a memorable one. They indeed had the lead, but Wayne Taylor and Max Angelelli had to be confident after their most recent victory. Andy Wallace had his hands full and needed the other two teams to have misfortune if he was to get back into contention. But while all eyes were on these three teams, a surprise winner threw a wrench into the works. We joined the race in the closing laps. Time running out, there's five and a half laps remaining. Into the museum curves. Can Butch Leitzinger hang on for his first Daytona prototype victory with Elliot Forbes Robinson? Butch doing a great job out there with the car. He's got no question about we talked to. Uh, the Crawford guys say the car is good in the wet. It's a good wet weather car. And it's, it must be. 
Oh, no, Christian to the point, he's gone! And in Big the time. wall. Big time, Rick. That's going to bring a caution out. Oh, no. That was a severe impact. Christian climbs from the dawn. Oh, boy, that was a nasty one. And this could win the whole thing for Butch Leitzinger. I can tell you that. We don't have that much time left in this race. This could be... It will be a full-course caution. It's got to be. This could be a checkered flag caution situation. And there it is. We've just seen it now come out. Fifth yellow. Fifth full-course yellow. And let's hope that Fittipaldi is all right. That was a major impact. He's on his feet. He's fine. Wayne, a roller coaster of emotion. We've seen a seesaw battle in the points, but the fact remains, if we finish the way we are right now, you'll go into Fontana three points behind, but victory there will still give you the tiebreaker and the championship still all to play for. Yeah, it really is. We didn't need uh, that car to go off. We were looking good until that, but um, yeah, it looks like it's going to go down to the wire, and um, we'll see what happens next round. Well, what about for the CompUSA Ganassi team? Scott Pruitt, Max Pappas, now a three-point lead going into the final race. It's a pressure cooker time, Brian. That's right, Lee. You know, it's such a roller coaster ride as far as the points went. Chip Ganassi wasn't even sure where they stood by the end of it. It's like going to play craps in Las Vegas. You're up, you're down, you're back and forth. Hey, Brian, I mean, that's why we came here. We knew this wasn't going to be a cakewalk. It's a great series and good competition. We've got one to go here. we got to bring it home with uh, Fontana, I guess. Well, we're getting the checkered flag right now, and that takes you out to Montana Max with a three-point lead. Does that change your mindset at all, or is it all looking for the win always? Here in the Comp USA Chip Ganassi Racing, we're prepared to fight. You know, we were expecting to go out to Fontana to go to the last race, and, uh, you know, we're prepared. Lexus is uh, getting ready. All the guys at Chip Ganassi Racing, you know, they're going to go out there to win the race uh, and win the championship. Well, there's still a lot of racing left. There's only one more event, guys, but the whole picture could change with only one turn out at Fontana. Wow, <laughs> three weeks to go and we will be there. The SunTrust Improve Your Position Award, the Howard Boss Motorsports team, the victorious Howard Boss Motorsports team of EFR, Elliot Forbes Robinson and Butch Lighting go from seventh to victory lane. Well done, boys. Their first victory in Daytona prototypes. A record-setting victory today, a sixth different Daytona prototype winner, Elliot Forbes Robinson is with Chris Neville. Lee, Elliot, uh, you guys, we were wondering when you were going to get the win all year long. You finally got it with only two races to go. Now, listen, whenever we can get it, it was great. You know, we've been close so many times this year, and we talked about it lunch the other day, man. We were due, and uh, fortunately, it came around this weekend. I really didn't expect it this weekend, but the car was great. Conditions were awful, but at least it worked out. The 54 crash was yet another chapter in a very rough season for Terry Borchella and the Bell Motorsports team. The finale in Fontana next as the Grand American Rolex Sports Car Series ends a remarkable season. After 4,700 miles and over 1,700 laps of racing, the Grand American Rolex Sports Car Series arrived in Fontana for the season finale. In GT, Bill Orblin was racing his teammate Boris Said for his second GT title. Bill suffered a scary moment earlier in the weekend when his engine let go. The team quickly changed it out and they obviously dodged a potentially disastrous situation if that had occurred during the race. Andy Lally and Mark Bunting needed to complete a lap to win the SGS crown. Not too many dramas there. But the Daytona Prototype Championship was up for grabs. Chip Ganassi Racing entered a third car in hopes of helping Pruitt and Pappas win the title. With a win, the 10 car could secure the championship. It was over before you knew it. This is the Lexus Grand American 400, the final and deciding round of this 2004 Rolex sports car season. It has been brilliant. How will it end? We'll find out now as the green flies here at Fontana. And it's one, two, three for Ganassi as they head down the front straight. Darren Law comes through on the inside. And here comes Elliot Forbes Robinson. Up on the 14th degree banking now, they're going to go around NASCAR turn one and two. But when they get to turn three, it's a bottleneck situation, a hairpin. Watch for the brake zone. Wayne Taylor tucks in there. So too does the Kodak Easy Share car. They were told in the driver's meeting to take it easy right here spin. at 2-3. We've got a spin at the turn seven oh, and no. another spin. Around goes the bell machine. And as well 54. the 27. I oh, know that's the nine. The go cars around backwards. On board the 58 with David Donahue. Terry Borchella got turned around. 
This man was in the middle of it. The sixth car right there, as well as Negri's car, it's in trouble. Meanwhile, back up front, look at this. It's the 0-1 of Mad Max Pappas who leads the way. The Sitco Crawford is in, Calvin. Well, here she comes, Milkaduna bringing the car in, and this car really had a lot more speed this morning in the warm-up than actually found, and she skids for a stop here. This pit lane is very slippery. The team are going to go to work and see what the problem is here, but they really found a lot of speed in this car this morning. They had a problem with the rear diffuser coming apart, the rear floor of the car, acting like a parachute, cost them a lot of straight-line speed. Milka's getting out, and now Andy's getting in, so she's completed a lap, and this, if he can take this to the finish today, this will be one long stint. We've seen him perform miracles before. Can Andy Wallace do it again? Get his third victory, Lee. Well, what did we see him do at one race? Was it two hours and 16 minutes? Wow, but now you're looking at three hours because you've only done one lap so far, and that's almost a three-hour race. He's going to be in there all day. You rejoin us at a dramatic time. One of the championship hopefuls, Wayne Taylor, is on pit road. Chris Neville is there. Lee, it looks like their championship hopes are definitely dashed. He's been down. Uh, it looks like he's going to go down a lap just about, uh, just about right now, actually. And uh, the problem with the 10 car is a fuel pickup issue. They're checking all the electronics in the car. They don't look like they really seem to find anything down here. So I have a feeling these guys are probably just going to be fighting this little bug for the rest of the day. That is devastating. That is crushing for their campaign, for Wayne Taylor in particular, the team principal. And the points as of now, hands Max Pappas, Scott Pruitt, the championship to the tune of 21 points. But of course, it's very early days. But that we've seen our two of our three championship contenders fall by the wayside in the opening 10 laps. The championship has come to an end and it is victorious. Scott Pruitt, Max Pappas not only win the race, they are the 2004 Rolex Sports Car Champions. Superb effort from CompUSA Ganassi Racing. And understandably, they celebrate. And look at how emotional he is. He has worked so hard. And look at this, a fresh winner in GT. The 16 of Tom Milner Jr. and Kelly Collins victorious there. There's young Tom. Formula BMW this year and sports cars to round out the year. But there's the man at the top of the field and the top of the championship tree. Scott Pruitt, he won Trans Am last year and he wins the Rolex Series this year. Not bad, huh? Great, the guys did a great job. All the Ganassi boys, Comp USA, Lexus, they gave us a little bit more for this race, just fine-tuning everything, and it's teamwork. That's what won us Goodyear, everything. <laughs> oh, the party started! But it's going to be, uh, I mean, this is awesome. I mean, Max has been great to drive with, and you're coming down to the last race, three points. It was like, oh, my gosh, but we pulled it off, and it's in fine style. Superb job for Scott, your seventh championship. Max, your first. Give us your feelings tonight. Uh, today's a fantastic feeling for us. You know, everyone in Chip Ganassi Racing wanted this championship very badly. First championship for Lexus, and uh, coming out of a very difficult uh, weekend for the motorsport in general. You know, I had in my heart uh, Randy Dorton and all the friends of Hendrick all weekend long, and, uh, you know, I drove from my heart. So that's it for the Grand American Rolex Sports Car Year in Racing. It was a landmark season for the Daytona prototypes and sports car racing in general. And while 2004 saw explosive growth of cars, teams and drivers, one thing remained the same. The Rolex Sports Car Series racing was awesome and 2005 will be no different. Bye for now and see you at the Rolex 24 in February.